Okay, so it's just uh, one minute past the half an hour here. Um, so we are um, maybe going to get started and people can keep streaming in. So I see some people are already introducing themselves in the chat box. That's great. Um, if uh, you haven't already, feel free to introduce yourself and what organization you're with. Um, that would be lovely. Um, so welcome, everyone. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, so this is uh, a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom webinar. So that means if you're not muted, everyone can hear you um, or everyone around you. And so since many of us are working um, in unconventional places right now, if you want to go ahead and mute yourself um, for the time being, that would be great. So we don't hear any kind of funny background stuff. Um, so yeah, so I'm Christine. I am the co-director of the Canadian Freshwater Alliance. And I am located here in snowy, uh, still coming down, yeah, southwestern Ontario, which uh, is specifically in London. And that is located in the Antler or Thames River watershed and also on the uh, traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Lunape people. Uh, I am really excited about the webinar today. There was a lot of interest. I was, um, yeah, I was really interested and excited to see so many registrations coming in. We have over 100 people that have registered um, from clear across the country, a really diverse group of people as well. We have um, municipal staff and elected leaders. Um, we also have people from different levels of provincial and federal government. We have staff and volunteers from environmental and nonprofit organizations, conservation organization uh, authorities, sorry, and organismes de bassin versant. Uh, we have environmental consultants, academics and researchers, and a whole host of other people that don't necessarily fall into one of those categories, but who are interested in green infrastructure. Um, so just a little bit on format for today. Um, we'll have a presentation from Jennifer Court, who I'll introduce in just a second. Uh, the presentation will be about half an hour, give or take, and then we'll have a fair amount of time toward the end for um, Q&A and discussion. Um, and so I'll kind of go through how we'll do that uh, when the time comes. So I just wanted to quickly um, give a bit of an intro um, for those of you who are new to the Canadian Freshwater Alliance or haven't been on one of our webinars or come to our events before. So we're a Canadian nonprofit initiative. Um, and we're a project that is based on MakeWay's shared platform. And our mission is really to build, connect, and unite networks of freshwater champions in order to drive change and um, ultimately to secure healthy waters for all. That's our, that's our big vision. I um, mean, we do this through a mix of uh, leading campaigns at the regional and national levels, connecting organizations and individuals and building capacity um, to, you know, to bring folks together and, and to, um, and to support their confidence and their ability and their skills and knowledge when it comes to securing freshwater health. And we do focus on a, a number of different priority areas in particular, um, and green infrastructure is one of those areas. So uh, for the past few years, we have been leading a green infrastructure community of practice with nonprofit organizations across the country. Um, and we've been working over, over the years to, to support each other, um, to learn about what needs to happen to really move the needle forward on green infrastructure um, in our local communities and how we can um, better support each other and learn from each other um, to be able to do that work. Um, so we are very lucky today to have Jennifer Court as our guest presenter. Jennifer is the executive director of the Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition. Um, Jennifer is a super thoughtful and experienced leader with a really impressive background in the environmental sector. And she's particularly interested in systems change. So she brings uh, an interdisciplinary perspective to, to drive that change into her work. Jennifer has a Bachelor of Design from the Ontario College of Art and Design and also a master's of environmental studies and graduate diploma of business and sustainability from York University. And Jen, I also have a MES from York, so I didn't know that fellow MES uh, graduate here. So I will go ahead and turn it over to Jennifer um, and allow you to share your screen. Um, perfect. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I'm really excited to be with everyone here today as well. Um, see some familiar names and faces popping up. 
in the um, the participants list. So um, those of you who know me, it's nice to, to be with you today. And uh, for the rest of you, it's nice to meet you. Um, so as Christine said, I'm the executive director of the Green Infrastructure Ontario Coalition. Um, looks like there's just a touch of a lag with my slides. Oh, there we go. Um, and so this slide provides a bit of an overview of um, what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I will start, though, by saying I'm joining from Toronto. Um, you know, even though we're all meeting virtually, I think it's nice to, uh, to acknowledge um, the land that we are uh, joining from. So Toronto is the traditional territory of many First Nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee and Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. And I acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, and just, yeah, really privileged to be joining from this land. Um, so I'm gonna cover um, a little bit of background about what GEO is, what we do, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, I also think it's always important to, to kick these things off talking about green infrastructure and how specifically um, we are using that term since there does seem to be a little bit of difference. And then I will uh, get onto the main event, sharing the results of our advancing municipal action on green infrastructure project. So GEO was founded in 2009 and is guided by a steering committee. We work to promote awareness and understanding of green infrastructure and to support policy and activities that increase the implementation of green infrastructure. Um, primarily across Ontario, it's right in our name, um, but a lot of the work that we do um, has national reach and translates beyond the scope of the province. Um, and so on the slide, what I really, the, I'm not gonna read to you everything, but I, what I wanna emphasize is that we really focus on the co-benefits, so the environmental, social, environmental, and health benefits of green infrastructure. Um, that co-benefit piece is very important and our overall goal is to make green infrastructure the new normal. Um, so green infrastructure first being integrated into policy and into practice. So I mentioned we're guided by a steering committee. Um, the logos on the screen represent our steering committee members. We also have a general coalition membership um, of people who have opted in um, because of their interest in green infrastructure. And that represents uh, business, NGOs, municipal, regional governments, CAs, um, private companies, et cetera. So good, good mix of people in our, uh, in our network. The work that we do falls under two main umbrellas. So the first is government relations. Um, so including both direct advocacy um, to promote that idea of green infrastructure first, as well as responding to um, proposed policies, legislation, consultations, preparing written comments. Um, historically, our work was very focused in Ontario and we've had some good successes here, um, but increasingly we've been working um, at the federal level since uh, there's, there's been a lot of um, interest and momentum there. And then the second umbrella is information sharing and communication. So um, conducting research um, ourselves or with partners and presenting those reports, presentations, workshops, and we also have a monthly newsletter. So I'm gonna give you just a couple of examples here. Um, as I mentioned on the GR side, we've been increasingly active at the national level, collaborating with groups like the Canadian Freshwater Alliance to do some joint outreach about the role that green infrastructure, natural infrastructure can play, um, particularly in these times, helping us grapple with the consequences of COVID and ultimately in our recovery um, and comparable work here in Ontario. And on the communication side, um, this slide highlights a couple of our most recent publications. Um, State of Large Parks in Ontario's Golden Horseshoe came out last year and has become particularly relevant during the pandemic as we've all been struggling with um, access to green space. Um, really highlights the, uh, the need for increased funding in that space. I encourage you to check it out. 
And then earlier in, uh, in early 2020, we released our economic impact assessment of the green infrastructure sector in Ontario, which was a first of its kind study that showed the, uh, the full scope of the contributions of the green infrastructure sector to the economy in Ontario. So both the GDP and jobs results. Um, and again, I encourage you to check it out. We were very pleased with our um, being able to present those findings. And you know, I highlighted the, the co-benefits piece of green infrastructure being so important um, and being able to present that economic analysis was a really um, useful tool in making the case for the variety of benefits that green infrastructure provides. Um, and then I'll also highlight, um, we, we launched a webinar series last year. It was the first, um, first time we tried that, uh, we focused on how to incorporate green infrastructure into asset management planning in partnership with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority and um, looking to launch some similar training in 2021, which will tie into the results of the, um, the work that I'm gonna share with you today. So as I said, I'd also like to talk uh, a little bit about what is green infrastructure to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, this definition relates directly to the scope of the project that I'm going to talk to you about. So we define green infrastructure as the natural vegetative systems and green technologies that collectively provide society with a multitude of economic, environmental, social, and health benefits. And so again, highlighting the co-benefits, it's a really crucial piece of the definition for us. And the other piece is that we include both natural and human-made solutions. So the green technologies piece. Um, essentially, we do mean living green infrastructure from natural systems like wetlands, forests, parks, meadows, as well as the soil that supports them uh, to enhanced assets, things like rain gardens, bioswales, urban trees, and stormwater ponds. Um, as well as engineered assets, so permeable pavement, green roofs and walls, rain barrels and cisterns, all of which um, you know, support and replicate ecological functions. So this definition is consistent with the definition in Ontario's provincial policy statement, which I'm not going to read to you, but is on the slide in front of you. Um, and GEO is very active in advocating for that definition to be included in the policy statement. Um, went through our environmental bill of rights process. Um, and this was the first higher level government definition of green infrastructure in Canada. Um, so very pleased to have that there. That of course influences um, a lot of subsequent policy and really helped to set the stage for green infrastructure um, in Ontario. So that was adopted in the 2014 policy statement, but we're very pleased to see that it has continued through into the recent, um, through the re recent revisions to that statement. And so to just provide a more visual snapshot, um, this slide breaks down the focus areas um, that we pay particular attention to at GEO, um, urban agriculture, green roofs and walls, urban forestry, green stormwater systems, parks and public spaces, and natural heritage systems. As I said, we do also include green technologies and soil in volumes and quality adequate to sustain green infrastructure. And I also want to emphasize what is not included in our definition. So in some other contexts, green infrastructure has been adopted as much more of a blanket um, definition. Um, so just so that we're all um, again on the same page, when I talk about green infrastructure, we are not including renewables, electric vehicles and EV charging infrastructure or conventional wastewater infrastructure. And that is a bit of a difference between how the term is used um, within some federal departments. Um, however, within the sector itself, the language is quite consistent. So again, we, we really talk about living green infrastructure. Um, sometimes used a bit synonymously with natural infrastructure, although again I'll emphasize we do include some of those more engineered systems. So now that we're all on the same page, I am going to provide an overview of uh, the project that we recently wrapped up, Advancing Municipal Action on Green Infrastructure. So this project was conducted in partnership with the Ontario Parks Association with funding 
by a, uh, a grant from the Greenbelt Foundation. Initially, the focus of the work um, based out of that funding was really on the, um, the Greenbelt region in Ontario. However, um, because COVID happened uh, quite quickly after we launched the project and we really had to pivot to doing a lot of our work virtually, um, the unexpected positive of that is that we were able to really expand our reach and get representation um, from across the province who could participate in our, um, our online workshops and our virtual activities in a way that they wouldn't have been if we were able to stick to our original plan of doing things in person locally. So um, is a slight silver lining there, despite a lot of challenges on the, in the background. The goal of the project was to identify gaps and barriers to the wider implementation of green infrastructure in the province of Ontario, as well as improving the access to resources and tools available to municipal stakeholders. So this was driven by discussions with our um, our partners, as well as the team at the Greenbelt, where, you know, we'd all heard a lot of things anecdotally or maybe from one, you know, from one partner who heard from a municipality or from one particular municipality about challenges that they were facing. Um, and we really wanted to collect a more broad range of feedback to uh, corroborate that, that anecdotal evidence that we had heard. And so our goal here was convening and engaging municipal champions and other key stakeholders, gathering information, and then compiling and developing tools and resources to provide ongoing support to these and other stakeholders. We had some broader objectives um, guiding our collective work. Uh, so I won't read this slide um, in detail, but just to sort of show you, um, these objectives related both to this specific project as well as to the other um, green infrastructure related activities that we were conducting with our partners. And as for the project activities themselves, they essentially broke down into two phases. The first of which was um, the first half of the year really focused on that research piece, gathering information, um, testing it, sharing back with stakeholders, um, getting their feedback. And so it was a bit of an iterative process. So um, starting with outreach, uh, getting a, a list together of municipal green infrastructure champions and other stakeholders who wanted to engage with us throughout this process. And then launching um, some surveying with that group and through our existing communication channels to start gathering some information. Concurrently doing desktop research to identify existing tools and resources um, to support the implementation of green infrastructure. And so that was something that was um, ongoing throughout the project. Um, once we had gathered results from our surveys, we um, summarized those initial results and shared them through a series of active research workshops with our stakeholders. Um, to get thoughts, to gather additional information, to again, sort of fact check what we had been hearing broadly, to dig deeper um, and have some real conversations with, um, with a group of stakeholders. And so those workshops included municipal staff, CA staff, um, as well as some NGO representation and um, a couple of private consultants who had worked in the space as well. Um, so a good range. And then following those workshops, so these two bullets in the middle are uh, sub bullets are actually kind of in reverse order. Um, we uh, did some one-on-one -on -one interviews to deep, dive, to deep dive a little bit further based on what we had heard in those um, active research workshops. Um, and that really gave us a good sense of the current lay of the land, gaps, barriers, challenges, what, what was out there, which I'll share with you in a moment. Um, and then we also developed some metrics to evaluate um, not just the progress of the project, but overall um, implementation goals. So how can we measure what's happening um, in green infrastructure on the ground? That was done together with our colleagues at the Greenbelt Foundation. And so then phase two um, is essentially the, the second half of the year, the next six months. So taking that research, 
um, continuing to engage with our stakeholder groups, but then looking at how we um, or partners, other people active in the space could start filling some of the gaps that existed um, and delivering resources, tools, and training that would be able to, um, to help fill those gaps and increase green infrastructure implementation on the ground. Um, so some ongoing engagement with, um, in particular, the municipal champions, but our stakeholder list. Um, updates about our progress, of course, and then some additional surveying um, about what we were working on and what uh, the stakeholders would like to see next. Um, as a direct result of some of that engagement, we piloted some training workshops, um, tested specifically with our stakeholders that we've been engaging with throughout the project um, to, to be able to uh, try some things out, gather feedback, be a little bit more experimental. And so those workshops, we did three, um, green infrastructure for climate adaptation and mitigation, economic valuation of green infrastructure benefits, and green infrastructure asset management planning. And so based on the results of those workshops, um, we're hoping to be able to scale that up into some broader training that we'll be delivering in 2021. And then the other key outcome was the creation of an online resource hub for uh, municipal stakeholders and other practitioners, which I will tell you more about. So this slide provides a snapshot of um, some of our key engagement results, just to give a sense of the, um, the breadth of who we were engaging with. So in total, um, over 260 stakeholders were engaged throughout the process um, through all of those various engagement channels that I've talked about. And this slide provides a bit more of a snapshot of that breakdown. So um, 28 municipalities in total, though many of those municipalities had um, a number of different staff who were engaging with us through um, those different um, surveys and workshops and, and training opportunities, six conservation authorities, nine NGOs, two private companies. And so some insights about those stakeholders. Um, generally, they were very familiar with green infrastructure. We, in, in our initial plan, had hoped through some in-person engagement to be able to get those champions to, uh, to bring along their more reluctant or their less, um, less familiar colleagues to our in-person events. Um, so one of the challenges of switching everything to virtual um, was that uh, kind of twofold. One, you know, there was less of that opportunity for people to sort of grab their colleague and bring them into a workshop. And and also municipal staff obviously were, were really spread quite thin because of the consequences of the COVID pandemic. And so um, we found that the, the people who continued to engage with us throughout were, were that group who were already very familiar and were green infrastructure champions. 78% um, of them were involved with green infrastructure as part of their job. So interestingly, some of these champions um, passionate about green infrastructure, but not currently part of their role. And then um, something else that I wanted to note here, we had, we had done, GEO had done some research back in um, 2016 about um, green infrastructure being included in plans here in Ontario. And the numbers were quite low at that point. And so we were really interested to see how that had changed um, and where, where green infrastructure was popping up. And so 92% um, of our municipal participants indicated that green infrastructure was included either in official plans, master plans or secondary plans, which was very encouraging to hear. A caveat is that some of them did also provide some, uh, some qualitative feedback along with that saying that even though it's included, it's not, um, it's not really having an impact yet. And so, um, you know, that was an interesting finding as well, but we were pleased to see that, that, that there has been increasingly more uptake in including green infrastructure at that planning level. So moving into some more of the detailed results, uh, a really key goal for us was to get a better sense um, of the, the gaps, challenges, and barriers, as I described. And so particularly during that initial phase, um, a lot of our um, a lot of our engagement was focused around 
understanding those gaps, digging deeper and sort of sorting them into some common challenges. And so the, the top four um, bullets on the screen that you'll see here were the four, by far the, more, the four most common barriers that were identified um, both through the initial surveys and then kind of fleshed out in a little bit more detail through our subsequent conversations. So funding, probably not a surprise to any of you, um, more funding generally, but also that the existing funding programs um, are not necessarily accessible to green infrastructure projects. Um, a lack of technical knowledge and understanding about the specific requirements of green infrastructure projects. Um, maintenance, so again, understanding, but then also support for um, and the cost of ongoing maintenance for green infrastructure solutions. And then knowledge and education or buy-in. And so that one breaks down into a few different levels, both um, the public or residents, getting them interested and engaged, bought into the need for green infrastructure. Um, colleagues, other municipal staff, staff in other departments, people who maybe had been trained um, in more conventional um, gray infrastructure practices and who haven't been won over to the idea of green infrastructure yet, and then also local elected officials. And so there, we got a lot of feedback about need for um, engagement and communication and ways to get those groups on board. Um, I'm not going to. I'm not going to read the rest of the bullets. I'll leave it up for a moment while I have a glass of water, and you can um, can read through those additional gaps and challenges. And so, just to elaborate on the the internal um, challenge. You know, it really was explained several times as a sort of business as usual mentality, the reliance on traditional approaches around, you know, landscaping, engineering, having standardized practices and being reticent to try new things. And so the challenge there can be changing people's minds and winning them over. So our final survey uh, focused on next steps and how we can continue to engage stakeholders around this topic um, and wanted to gauge interest in um, a few different ideas or have participants um, let us know how they'd like to hear from us. And so some of the top um, responses were around a toolkit for municipal champions um, to engage those key stakeholder groups that I mentioned um, to be able to, to educate, get buy-in, have the information necessary and, and tactics necessary to do that. Um, developing a green infrastructure community of practice focused more on the, the municipal level. So I know Canadian Freshwater Alliance has got a, a community of practice. The audience there is a little different though. Um, webinars, interactive workshops, panel discussions, and then also ongoing communication from us. And so um, that those results are really going to inform um, where GEO takes our work in this space next and what we're going to be offering. And so um, if there's anything that you're interested in, continue to engage with us. And so I also thought it would be interesting to share um, some of the, the suggestions we got around training um, just to, to potentially stimulate the discussion we're gonna have afterwards. So um, again, I'm not going to read through um, all of these suggestions, but I just kind of wanted to, to pop them on screen in case anybody who's on the call today has any um, any thoughts or any feedback that they want to share? Um, so um, a, a big one, a big gap that I haven't, a challenge that I haven't really talked about yet is related to um, green infrastructure asset management planning. So I did mention that we ran some training around this. Um, here in Ontario, our asset management regulation, OREG 58817, um, requires all municipalities, first of all, to have an asset management plan for their um, their traditional assets, um, but then also to include all other assets by July 2023, which includes green infrastructure assets following the definition that I shared with you. And so incorporating green infrastructure into asset management planning is something that's very new, um, certainly here in Canada, but also really internationally as well. And so 
Um, we have been doing, um, we were very involved in the advocacy to have that included in the regulation. And so now that it is, we wanna make sure that we're providing support um, to municipalities. And so together with a number of partners, we've been working on um, providing resources. So we um, developed a webinar series, excuse me, which I mentioned we delivered with the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority around this space, but um, we'll, which will be rerunning re in 2021 um, and doing workshops and sharing information. But this one is, uh, this one's a real challenge. It's getting, um, getting I mean, people's heads around a different set of stakeholders heads around the, the valuation of natural assets in a way that complies with traditional corporate asset management planning. Um, so I'm not gonna go fully down that, that road today, but um, for anybody who has um, dipped into it, you'll know it's a, it's a little complex and it can be um, a very different way of thinking about assets um, for asset managers. And it's a different way of thinking about green infrastructure for people who aren't in that space. And so I wanted to highlight that that's a key area. Um, we certainly heard a lot about it from our, our stakeholders here in Ontario who know that that regulatory um, requirement is on the horizon. Um, but it's, it is a really great way of, of valuing and looking at natural assets. And so I think it's applicable for those of you who are in other jurisdictions as well. Um, cost benefit analysis, another one, ongoing maintenance came up quite a bit. Um, the Build Back Better piece, certainly very relevant now. Um, and then another slide. So introductory content to be able to share uh, more broadly, the policy and planning piece. Um, and we heard a lot about specific examples about how green infrastructure works. Um, here in Canada, in colder climates, looking at international examples and how they apply here. And so um, coming to the end now, um, as I mentioned, another, um, another key outcome from this project was the de development of a municipal resource hub. So we, uh, that research that, that we conducted throughout, um, can, compiled together with um, feedback from our stakeholders, um, additional conversations, we've pulled together um, quite a few resources, guides, tools to support municipalities and other practitioners. Um, it's intended to be a living resource that will be regularly updated. Um, the bullets in front of you show the different sort of categories of information that we're covering. Uh, so this is accessible through our website. I'm going to show you a, uh, a snapshot in a moment. Um, but if you go to GEO's website and, and to our resources section, you'll be able to see it. Um, and this was developed on the guides platform. So uh, like I said, so here I'm going to show you a little snapshot. So this is a, a screen grab of our website. Um, clickable button up at the top for resources will take you to this page. You click again and it takes you into the guides platform and this is where that resource um, lives. Something cool about guides, you can subscribe um, there on the page and then you'll be notified anytime it's updated. It's very interactive. Um, I highly encourage you to check it out. And if you have resources uh, that you think are important that are not there, please share them. Um, trying to be as comprehensive as possible, but it's certainly possible that we've missed some things. So uh, we really want it to be a, a tool that we can also use for engagement and for learning more about what's happening in the space. <clears throat> and so finally, a few key take takeaways for, um, for municipalities from this project. So uh, municipalities play uh, a key role in increasing green infrastructure implementation. We really found that having a municipal champion or having a champion within your municipality is key. Um, those municipalities who've been particularly successful found that cross-departmental support made that possible. So working with colleagues, um, breaking down those silos, working across departments and across disciplines. <clears throat> we mentioned that a particular challenge that was noted by a lot of our participants was getting both council and resident support. Um, for municipalities who had been successful, we did compile some, some strategies, some tips. So um, unfortunately, flooding, local flooding has often been a catalyst um, 
I think there's a real need to develop some hooks that don't involve a, a small local catastrophe. Um, Hands-on hands engagement was also a really good tool for building buy-in. <clears throat> and so what I mean by that, things like leading site tours, you know, developing pilot projects and having those open both to residents and also inviting counselors to tour them. <clears throat> Bear with me for one second, it's a lot of talking. And also getting both of those groups as involved as possible in real shovels in the ground work. So um, engaging residents in implementing um, green infrastructure when possible and similarly getting councils out to break ground and do planting activities um, really helps to get that level of commitment. Um, and then of course, sharing results um, and continuing to share results. Uh, often green infrastructure projects, you know, can take a longer time to mature. Um, that's the ongoing maintenance piece. And so being able to continue to show projects over their life cycle um, can be a good way to keep people engaged. Um, and then planning, planning small pilot projects uh, coupled with a strong communication campaign, getting people excited about it and then scaling that up. Um, so again, those are some strategies that we heard um, municipalities had some specific success with. Um, another key tip, budgeting for the full life cycle of a project. So uh, this is again on that ongoing maintenance and operations piece. Um, so whereas in a traditional infrastructure project, um, a, the, the, the by far the bulk of the cost is upfront capital costs. In green infrastructure projects, um, the capital costs are just a small piece the ongoing operating costs can be much more significant. And so green infrastructure projects typically are much less expensive than traditional infrastructure, but that cost can be spread over, spread over a long time. And so one participant who um, had actually worked across kind of all of our stakeholder groups, um, municipality, um, NGOs, and as a private contractor, um, so a good, good kind of range of, of view um, said that in his experience, capital costs can typically account for only 20 to 25% of the total long-term project costs, just to give a bit of a snapshot. So that's a bit anecdotal, but um, shows you really what that, that contrast is. So you need to have a good long-term budget. Um, and then using consistent language, so both within the sector, but then also internally helps to avoid confusion and lead to credibility. And then finally, as well, um, for municipalities who had gone through the process already, they really found that incorporating green infrastructure into asset management plans um, has helped them with that process internally and has helped get, get buy-in, get access to funding. There's a real advocacy for using a consistent methodology for the valuation of green infrastructure assets. Um, since it is quite new, a lot of municipalities are kind of figuring it out. And so the more, the more quickly, the more we can collaborate on developing that consistent methodology, the better. So um, that's all for me. Um, as we move into 2021, as I said, we're gonna be continuing to, to learn from this project and, um, <coughs> excuse me, both internally at GEO and with our partners um, continue to, um, play a role supporting municipalities and other practitioners in overcoming these gaps. Um, so yeah, we're, we, I, I'd love to hear from you about how these findings resonate, um, what else we could be doing. So thank you very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was, uh, that was really great. Um, so we have uh, about 20 minutes um, for discussion, um, Q and A. Because we have about 50 people on the line, maybe what I can propose is if you have um, if you have something that you'd rather say orally, um, just maybe make a note in the chat and then I can ask you to unmute yourself so not everyone is unmuting at the same time. Um, I also know that there's a really good diversity of people on this webinar that might have experience and might wanna be able to speak to some things that, um, uh, that, that might give uh, a bit more kind of uh, perspective um, or add to the perspective that, that Jennifer has just offered us. So if someone has something that they want to add to one of the questions that comes up, 
um, or wants to speak about their own experience, either as a municipal staff person or um, you know, working uh, closely with municipalities on advancing GI, I think we'd really welcome to hear um, you know, your perspective as well. So um, yeah, so if you wanna, if you want to unmute yourself, please just let us know in the chat. Otherwise you can ask questions um, or comments in the chat. Um, I see Kevin has has uh, had a few comments here about um, you know not waiting for small catastrophes to catalyze GI um, and you know and and really trying to kind of drive that idea of you know green stormwater infrastructure being disaster mitigation. Um, and then uh, I think a comment here also about. Um, operations and, and maintenance on private property is why low impact development or green infrastructure is often not undertaken by municipalities on, on private property. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd love to respond or, or sort of engage with a few of Kevin's comments. So first of all, I, I definitely think on the volunteerism, it's really important not to make volunteerism a standard component of green stormwater. I totally agree. I think there's just an engagement strategy to, to come out as a bit of a demonstration piece. The work certainly should be done by, professional, by professionals and not rely on volunteers. Um, just people to plant things and it can be a nice community uh it's more of a, a sort of a pr event to get that buy-in piece so um just to to clarify um and then on the the private property um piece i didn't get into that but that's you know the the public versus private lands um and and where these uh where green infrastructure or where lid is being implemented um definitely can be a can be a bit of a challenge um, there are a variety of barriers around um, green infrastructure in general on um, on private lands and particularly LID and um, a few of the stakeholders we engaged with are doing some cool work. Um, Credit Valley Conservation, for example, has been doing some um, some projects looking at both public and private land and the criteria for developing successful LID on um, on private land. So Kevin, I, I don't know where you're, um, what organization you're with or, or where you're joining from, but they that work might be interesting to you. But um, there are a lot of challenges to implementing green infrastructure on private land that do relate to that maintenance, but also just access, you know, even in the tree planting space, um, being able to get into somebody's yard and, and plant a tree, even if they want it, and then make sure that that young tree gets the um, the care that it needs over the first couple of years to, to be able to survive um, can be a real challenge. So uh, yeah, it's a it's an important, um, that's another kind of area to, to note that there are some, uh, some other factors that, that go into how those solutions can be implemented. Um, okay, so Adrian, um, from Saanich, the city of Saanich, um, is uh, asking if canopy cover or forest is considered green infrastructure according to your definition. Yes, it is. Okay, uh, okay. someone from Salmon Safe BC potentially wants to unmute themselves. Um, so you may do so if you would like to add something. Hi everybody, it's Teresa Fresco here from Salmon Safe BC. Um, I, I had a, a couple, a, a question and a comment, if, if that's okay, uh, for our facilitator there. Yeah. Hi, okay. Teresa. Yeah, go so, for it. <laughs> <laughs> hi, and, and, and just thank you, uh, Freshwater Alliance, for uh, connecting. Um, you know, I'm coming from the British Columbia side, but I really appreciate this opportunity to learn from uh, GEO, and so thank you, Jennifer. It's been a really fascinating um, presentation for us and also a lot of learning. So I'm really looking forward to connect. Um, I had a question about um, just uptake on the ground. And so it's really encouraging to see uh, municipalities incorporate green infrastructure in their OCPs and other plans. Um, and and you, you made a comment about uh, that that's encouraging, but um, there's still some challenges with uh, having GI uptake on the ground. So I just wanted a, a little bit more information about that and maybe um, some answers around, you know, what are you guys seeing in terms of best practices to get uptake of green infrastructure on the ground? 
um, like is it incentive programs are municipalities you know finding uh, that they they need to incentivize it somehow by maybe uh, expedited permitting like th those kinds of things I'm really curious what that looks like uh, over in Ontario um, and just to echo that some of the findings that you presented in your study we, we are also seeing those similar things here in British Columbia in terms of um, uptake of green infrastructure and some of the needs that municipalities have been telling us in terms of information they need to, to, to do that more in their communities. So uh, yeah, just a two-part question there, thanks. Awesome, thank you, Teresa. Uh, if I could also just quickly add to that, Jennifer, um, I, I also had a question about kind of that, that gap between policies and plans and on the ground implementation. And I was actually, I was having a conversation with um, uh, so some folks from an, uh, an environmental organization in a municipality that I won't name, but um, uh, about working with us on a, on a project that we're trying to get off the ground. And, you know, the, they were saying that, you know, this municipality actually has a lot of great strategies, like they have a green infrastructure strategy, they have an urban, um, an urban tree or urban forestry strategy, I think they even had a local wetland strategy, but um, in terms of implementation, there was, you know, like they were building new developments and and taking out swales um, and, and local wetlands. And, um, you know, so at, that, that kind of implementation piece was, there was a really big gap between what was on paper and then what was happening. So I'm not sure if kind of to build on Teresa's question, like throughout the course of your research, you kind of gleaned any insights from folks that you were talking to about how to bridge that gap and, or maybe what is needed on paper to, um, to really kind of you know, expedite that that on the ground transformation. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. So I'm, there's a there's a lot there. So I'm going to do my best to um, to address all of the the facets of that. Um, so as far as the the piece related to um, you know seeing seeing green infrastructure included in plans, but then not. Um, not necessarily happening on the ground. Um, some of those gaps were around um, specificity of language. Um, so, you know, there might be reference. So, and, and the surveying that we did around this was quite general around, you know, whether or not um, a variety of different, you know, types of green infrastructure or terms around green infrastructure were included. And so, um, there may have been reference to, um, you know, some of these different like green stormwater management or um, canopy cover targets, um, but they they weren't overarching. And so, you know, while there might be one specific area of focus that didn't necessarily translate across um, um, into a more broad green infrastructure strategy. Um, and that really relates back to the idea that green infrastructure, unless you have a green infrastructure strategy, um, green infrastructure can really fall into the gaps. You know, it crosses so many different um, departments that no one department um, necessarily feels a sense of ownership. And so can wind up being quite fragmented. And so that's something that that happens in the at the planning level as well, where you might have bits and pieces here and there, but um, different stakeholders, it doesn't come together into a cohesive strategy. Um, there's also the challenge that it's it's just, you know, it gets somebody pushes to get it included, um, and then it doesn't, you know, that that doesn't translate strictly enough into guidelines and actual like actionable. Um, on the ground um, requirements into that sort of like guidelines and bylaws stage. Um, and so, you know, getting, getting some language into an official plan is, is great, but it's kind of just the first step and it does really need to trickle down. Um, as far as things have been working, um, it is a bit of a blend and it can really depend on, um, on that mix between either strong policy with, um, guidelines that have been developed internally with bylaws that require certain policies to be followed or with a really engaged um, champion or handful of champions who are going to stay on it and push that forward. And so we saw examples of both of those strategies working. I think, you know, 
the the champions model um, is a bit more fragile because if your champion leaves or gets redeployed or um, you know the, a lot a lot of things that can happen as far as staffing is concerned and that that can really lead to the whole the whole thing falling apart and projects not getting the the long term operations and maintenance care that they need and so. Um, yeah, we've we've definitely seen more long term success with the development of local bylaws and then also as I've said guidelines and standards a few times here that was something that you would have you would have seen come up in the gaps and barriers. Um, certain municipalities uh, have developed their own internal guidelines um, for a variety of different types of projects The Toronto green streets guides are a good example when you're looking at green stormwater management. Um, and those tend to, to be effective. Thunder Bay has also developed a lot of internal guidelines around, again, they're, they're very focused on low impact development and stormwater management, uh, green stormwater management, and they found that really helped. Um, and so one of the recommendations we heard quite a few times was that there's a real need for more broad guidelines so that it's not on the, the onus of the municipality to develop those individually from the ground up, but that having something um, certainly provincial, but obviously also something federal would be great to be able to ensure that municipalities have the support they need, standardized practices, nobody needs to reinvent the wheel, and that, yeah, those, those best practices and, and learnings are all being incorporated. I hope I answered most of that at least. Awesome, thanks Jennifer. Uh, we have a question here from Sarah O'Neill. Um, if you're able to speak to the main sources of funding that were identified, and if you dug into why certain funding isn't as accessible for GI. Yes. Yeah, and uh, Christine, I see you nodding there. We've, <laughs> we've done quite a bit of work on this, um, certainly together as well at the federal level. Um, I didn't really get into funding today because the unfortunate short answer is that COVID really upended a lot of the traditional sources of funding that did exist. Um, and so a lot of funding that has traditionally been available for green infrastructure, natural infrastructure, um, some of those streams were, were redirected to COVID recovery, very necessarily. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing the glimmers of some announced, you know, some announcements that are coming that are hopefully going to lead to programs and new funding sources. Um, <clears throat> But so the snapshot is um, at the, a, a lot of the work, you know, my knowledge is, um, is, a, is quite focused in Ontario um, on this space, but um, there are a couple of programs that are, that are sort of universal. And so but those both start federally, um, the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund, DMAF, um, allows for green green natural infrastructure is the language that they'll use federally. Um, that one is administered directly through Infrastructure Canada and can be very good. The challenge is there is that the threshold is very high, which is something that seems like a kind of a wild challenge, but it's projects um, for a minimum of $20 million. And one of the advantages of green infrastructure is that it's, you know, it's cost effective. It takes a lot, you got to do a lot of green infrastructure implementation to make that add up to $20 million. So we have seen some successes there um, for large kind of um, aggregated projects, but it can be a real, um, it can be a real challenge and it's also very time consuming to apply. They don't acknowledge the co-benefits. So there are some challenges on that front. Um, another, another sort of universal stream, um, also initially administered through Infrastructure Canada, but then delivered through bilateral agreements with the provinces is the ICIP program. And I always forget exactly how the words go in that acronym, Investing in Canada, Invest in, Investment Canada Infrastructure Program, some, those words, some combination. Um, the ICIP program has, is broken then into streams. One of the streams, the green stream, focuses specifically on, um, or it includes natural infrastructure as something that can be funded. However, uh, the challenge on that front, twofold. One, the provinces set the priorities. And so when you're in a province like Ontario, where the provincial government isn't as aligned around environmental priorities, they haven't, um, they haven't focused on the delivery of that stream. 
there was one intake pre-COVID, it was very rurally focused and um, the, the criteria that they set forth were not particularly favorable to natural infrastructure projects. And realistically, what we've seen across the country through that program is a lot of funding for conventional wastewater treatment. It's very necessary, certainly in a lot of areas. And so that's the challenge um, over, overall with a lot of these federal programs is that um, natural infrastructure, green infrastructure projects have to compete with other much needed um, essential infrastructure projects. And there's a prioritization over conventional practices or um, you know, remediating crumbling infrastructure. If your community needs a, needs a wastewater plant, they need a wastewater plant. And so um, we, what we have been advocating for um, together with the Canadian Freshwater Alliance and some other organizations is a dedicated fund for natural infrastructure. Other funding sources on the ground come down to, uh, you know, specific programs that are launched. Oh, I guess I'll shout out that the, um, the uh, Eco Action Program just launched and they call out specifically um, natural infrastructure projects focused on freshwater. I'm sure that this is very much of interest to, uh, to our hosts today. Um, so that's a good one. You know, every intake is different, but they have been focusing on natural infrastructure lately. Otherwise it comes down to independent sort of grants and, and one-off programs at the provincial level. And as I said, those have all been really redirected. So the overarching challenge though is not programs that don't recognize the co-benefits. Um, and so natural infrastructure doesn't seem as competitive against other projects and, um, and just the, the timelines. Yeah, I think another issue that was noted with uh, DMAF as well with regard to green infrastructure um, is just that green infrastructure tends to be so much more cross-departmental than, than gray infrastructure. So it just, it doesn't necessarily have the flexibility to allow for that collaboration, um, not even just in the municipal organization, but across partners as well. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that Sarah, uh, who asked that question was, um, I believe this is probably the same Sarah, uh, the, uh, the author of uh, a great report a few years ago about, um, municipal funding mechanisms for um to, to fund you know a stormwater um green stormwater infrastructure um so i'm not sure if in ontario if there if you had any kind of interesting examples of of local funding mechanisms or levies i know in bc there are a few municipalities that have some um some interesting kind of levies or or um you know permeability taxes or what have you to to fund that um, that work. Did you come across any in Ontario? Oh, sorry. Okay. I was sorry, I was like, is that, in, in or is that for Sarah? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, I think, you know, something that's interesting, increasingly more municipalities are looking at um, stormwater charges, um, so decoupling um, this water fee, stormwater from water fees, and then building in um, green infrastructure incentive programs into that system, which I think is great. It pushes more to the, um, yeah, the, the sort of mitigation and, and reducing, um, reducing stormwater or managing stormwater on site. Um, you know, moving that, incentivizing private businesses to be doing that work on site um, is a great step. Um, other examples, um, you know, specific, there certainly are, there certainly are some great ones, um, specific bylaws. Um, unfortunately, after all of this talking, they've, they've flown right out of my mind, but I'm, I'm happy to follow up. Great. Um, and I saw um, somebody asked a question about a specific um, or bylaws that have been acted by municipalities. I also shared a great BC based resource called the Green Bylaws Toolkit, which is a very large, like several hundred pages um, toolkit that was put together um, that has a lot of great case studies of um, it, it's not limited to green infrastructure, but it includes green infrastructure. Um, we have a, a few more questions, but we are actually already at time. Um, so maybe um, we'll have to leave it there, unfortunately. But Jennifer, it was it was super great to have you. I'm really glad you're able to share um, that research with everyone and for everyone that was able to join us. 
I'm sure we'll have uh, many more conversations in the in the months to years to come, and especially with hopefully some interesting green infrastructure policies and potentially funding coming down the pike from the at least the federal level. Um, we'll hopefully see the the landscape um, figuratively and literally transforming. Um, in mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. And thank you to everyone who's able to join us today. We have recorded it. So we will send out a recording as well. And if you have any questions for, for me or for Jennifer following the presentation, please uh, don't hesitate. You should have my email because I sent you a few reminders. So you should have my email. Please reach out. And other than that, we, um, we will be in touch with uh, further webinars or um, uh, events or resources of interest. So thank you very much and take care, everyone. Thanks for having me.